All right. So, I need everyone to look forward. Dan, look forward. Yes, sir. Not talking. Super. Okay. We need to continue today with our um, discussion of circular motion. We are going to review a couple of terms. So, if you were absent uh, the last day, this will catch you up on some of the stuff. Now, we need to remember that there's a, a differentiation between speed and velocity, okay? Because speed, we know, is what type of quantity? Scalar, so it does not have direction. Velocity, on the other hand, does. So, an object can have a constant speed, but have a changing velocity. Because the magnitude of the velocity could stay constant, so the speed, but the direction could change. And that's what's happening with circular motion. So we really need to um, sort of key into that fact because it helps us understand some of the subsequent concepts. Okay, so um, in a full cycle, you can describe the motion in two different ways. Now, I'm going to introduce a couple of things that you may or may not have been you know, exposed to previously. Um, some of this is sort of extra. All right, you don't actually have to do calculations in radians, but it is important to sort of understand what a radian is compared to, say, a degree. Because in a full circle, you have two pi radians, which is six points, I'm rather, radians, okay? But in a first full circle, how many degrees do you have? 360. So when we talk about um, measuring, basically what we're measuring here is arc length, okay, from one specific point, okay, to another specific point, we have an arc, okay? So our arc length can be measured in degrees or radians. So that's what we're talking about. Now, 360 degrees is 2 pi rads. 180 is pi rads. Enough. Now, we have to remember um, centripetal acceleration is always going to be in what direction? Towards the center. That's what centripetal means. Center seeking. Okay. So, if we identify it as this, you know, object moves in a circle, the tangent line will always describe the direction of the velocity, but the acceleration will always be towards the middle. All right. This is just reviewing a couple of things. Now, you can algebraically um, derive the equation, force and triple acceleration. Um, you know, we v squared over r basically is what you end up with. But the derivation of it is not required for this course. Now, we're going to talk about centrifugal force. So, here's my bond thingy. So, how do you like my centrifuge, Mr. Bond? When I throw this lever, you will feel centrifugal force crush every bone in your body, in body, not body, you mean centripetal force. There is no such thing as a centrifugal force. He's saying that because it's actually an apparent force, isn't it? It's based on inertia. Now, this guy's a laughable, laughable claim, Mr. Bond, perpetuated by overzealous teachers of science. Simply construct Newton's laws in a rotating system, and you will see centrifugal force term appears plain as day. Come on now, do you really expect me to coordinate substitution in my head while strapped to centrifuge? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. I like it when they say that. That's fun. Anyway, um, but we want to talk about centrifugal force uh, because it's often referred to as an apparent force. It's really an expression of an object's uh, inertia or the tendency to move in a straight line. So it requires a force to counter that outward tendency or that tendency to go in a straight line. And so 
centripetal force is real. You know, you have to, you know, apply that force to change the direction. Okay, so it fits, it's classical physics, because you need to apply force to cause an acceleration. An acceleration is defined as a change in velocity or change in time. Then a change in direction is a change in velocity. Okay, so that all works. Uh, but the outward tendency is not an actual force. There is no, you know, force pulling in that direction, but there is the outward tendency of inertia. Okie dokie. So if I was to release the ball, it would move uh, tangentially to the circle. Okay, it's going to just go in a straight line from the point of release. Now, so Newton's first law, I want to go in a straight line. The force is going to, going to counter that. And that's centripetal force. Okay, something has to provide it. If we're talking about uh, you know, a ball rotating in a circle uh, attached to a string, then the string is providing that force. Therefore, the centripetal force you can equate with the string tension. So tangential velocity we can describe as 2 pi over t, acceleration, v squared over r, and force, mv squared over r. Now, on your formula sheets, we do not have this formula. Okay, so I'm, you know, strongly recommending you commit that to memory. But you can derive it because you can say F equals ma, and if A equals V squared over R, then F will equal MV squared over R. So it can be derived, but because you use it so often, I would recommend, you know, not going through the derivation process every time you want to use it. Just remember it. Now here we have uh, some situations where we have a curve, or a car following a curve on a flat road. Now, if we have a flat road, so we're talking about a scenario where there's no banks, okay, so an unbanked curve, the inward force has to be supplied by what? The friction. The frictional force of the tires on the road, so you can see that's the tractional force, so I can use this expression on a flat road. Fc, or centripetal force, equals FF. Now that can be useful because I can then say mv squared over r equals ufn, which is actually mg. And then the mass becomes irrelevant. So in some of these questions you might think, I don't have the mass, I don't have enough information. Well, you don't need the mass, actually. You can go from there and calculate the velocity, radius, um, coefficient of friction, gravity. You don't need to calculate. It's constant. Okay? But that equivalence will help you solve a lot of those questions. Okay, now we also want to remember that on a horizontal surface, Fn is equal to negative Fg. So if Fg is pulling down, Fn is pushing up, but the magnitude is going to be the same and can be described as Mg. <clears throat> All right, now is this going to be the same if I have a banked curve? And we are going to examine that scenario a little bit later. But right now, we just want to understand a flat curve. Okay. Now, we do want to understand in a free body diagram how I would label everything. Now, notice, you know, FG is straight down. That's to be expected. FM, exactly opposite direction. The force of friction... I am indicating is going inside if I'm told that the car is going in a circle. And I can also say that FC is in the same direction because 
force friction is providing the centripetal force. All right. So this type of exercise, being able to label free body diagram in reference to you know an object going around a curve, would be a good thing to be able to do. Okay, motion, a horizontal circle. That's a fancy car. Love that car. Okay, so here's an example question. The track has a radius of 50 meters and the limiting frictional force is 0.5 the car's weight. Find the car's maximum speed before it slides off the track. So, Justin, how would I approach this question? What would be my next step? Um, um, hmm. Can someone help Justin? <laughs> Apparently not. Okay, well, let's just think of this. It says the limiting frictional force is equal to 0.5 of the car's weight. Do I know a mathematical expression that would describe the car's weight? How about that? Okay, Fg equals mg. Now, it says that the limiting frictional force, so the friction, force of friction is half of this, all right, now, I also know that on a flat curve, what force is equal to the force of friction? Centripetal force, Fc, right? So, mv squared over r is going to equal 0 0.5 mg, right? Well, think about it. If you're not convinced, it tells me the frictional force is 0.5 of the car's weight, isn't it? The weight is mg, so the frictional force must be 0.5 mg. That's pretty straightforward, right? Yeah, should be. Okay, that means the mass becomes irrelevant, and so I don't really need it. But it says, uh, what is the car's maximum speed before it slides off the track? So what am I looking for here? V. Look for V. So I'll say V is going to equal 0 0.5 G times R square root E. Okay. Uh, now that's doable. I know what G is. I know what R is. So I should be able to get an answer. Look at that. So it's going to be 0 0.5 times 9.81 times 50. That's awesome. 15.7 meters per second. Right, so that's that part. Goes right in the water. Now we are going to talk about a banked road. So we talked about a flat curve, but we do want to talk briefly about a banked curve as well. That kind of bank. And actually, most of the roads that we have, you know, out on the highway, most of them are banked, okay? Um, in fact, there, you know, quite often you'll see that the speed limit changes around certain corners. Or it'll say sort of like a maximum. Exit ramps and stuff like that. The calculation to determine the maximum is very similar to what we would be doing here. Okay. You still need to use the wheel, yeah. <laughs> okay, but the calculation is based on um, a very low coefficient of friction for the surface, so an icy road, basically. All right. So let's have a look at this. Curves are quite often banked. Um, so the view from above the car would look a little bit like this. Behind the car, if we think about that, you're actually on a bank. 
okay? So you are going to have um, part of the centripetal force being provided by what we would have called on inclined planes, sort of like the, the force down the plane, I guess. Okay? Well, basically, it is a centripetal force that is supplied partly by um, the normal force. Because the normal force is pointing out this way, isn't it? But we know that a vector like this has components. Because this is has a vertical component and a horizontal component. Now that horizontal component is pointing what direction? Towards the center. Okay, so part of the centripetal force is going to be coming from that horizontal vector. Okay, so this is kind of the vector diagram you'd want to create. All right, you have force of gravity is downwards represented by the vertical. Your normal force is perpendicular to the surface. And FC becomes the horizontal component. All right. And this is your angle. And this angle will turn out to be the same as this angle and this angle when you, you know, look at the geometric properties. So we can see that tan theta is going to equal offset over adjacent, or FC over FG. So that means MGR, or MB squared over R, divided by MG. So the M's go away. And you end up with um, tan theta equals V squared over RG. And this is our banked curve equation. Is this bank curve equation on the formula sheet? No. Uh, so, you basically, this is one you're going to have to remember. The circled one. The red circled one. With green and blue as well. Oh, no. Blue. Okay. So, V squared over RG. It is an R. That R, so we know V should stand for tangential velocity. R stands for the radius of the curve. G is acceleration of gravity. I don't know. Why not? Okay. Um, it could be lowercase. Lowercase is fine. If you like lowercase for R better, I will allow it. Okie dokie, so if a curved road is not horizontal but banked, the normal force of the road will have the component in the centripetal direction, which we would normally call the horizontal. Okay. Um, now the banking angle is usually chosen, usually, so that no friction is needed. So if the coefficient of friction equals zero, okay, then you still have enough of the centripetal force due to the banking to keep the car going in, um, you know, a circle. Now, there is going to be a maximum speed, though. At some point, if you are going too fast, um, the, you know, centripetal force due to the bank is not going to be enough. And you will go, you know, off and be bad. Later we will. <clears throat> okay. Now this just shows that you can uh, do a different vector diagram and get a slightly different equation where you have sine theta equals mv squared over r over fn. Now I think that the other one makes more sense to me and I would just remember the one. So don't remember two. You'll get mixed up. That's it.